whilst Norwegian Vikings had been island hopping across the North Sea to raid Anglo-Saxon, Irish, Scottish, Pictish and Welsh monasteries since the end of the 8th century, their Danish counterparts tended to focus upon the vast and rich remnants of Charlemagne's Francia, just to their southern flank in mainland Europe. These raiders included such famous sea kings as Ragnar Lothbrok and Haston, along with dynastic rulers in Denmark such as King Horik. By the late 830s, however, some of the most ambitious of these piratical raiders on the continent began to look northwards to Britain and Ireland to raid. Whilst the Anglo-Saxon and Gaelic kingdoms of Britain and Ireland weren't as prosperous or as rich as Francia, they were nowhere near as used to the annual raids which now plagued the European mainland. The Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were probed for weaknesses, and for now at least, some of the Danish raiders in Francia seemed to have opted to go to Ireland instead. The focal point of Gaelic Christianity and an island that had just recently embarked upon a golden age of culture. There they came into contact with their northern brethren from Norway, who seemed to have already set themselves up to a certain extent upon the outlying isles around modern day Scotland since they had first raided there at the tail end of the 8th century. In around 837, in an event which would reverberate with horror throughout the Irish contemporary chronicles of the time, a fresh fleet appeared upon the Irish coast. It was led by a battle-hardened sea king, the first to be called such in the Irish sources, which refer to his fleet as a royal one. Along with a vast fleet of 120 ships, Thorgest had arrived, and everything in Ireland was about to change. Thorgest, often Gaelicised in the Irish sources as Togesius, seems to have had dynastic links of some kind back in Scandinavia, and he seems to have used this influence to bring together the various factions already in Ireland under his leadership. He had probably been periodically raiding in Ireland since as early as 820, and almost certainly had a good idea of the geography of the island, both from his own men and from Irish prisoners. The location of monasteries would have been important intelligence to establish, as was an understanding of the political situation as such, it seems entirely possible that the exact timing of the arrival was not random. Ireland in the 830s was divided amongst a multitude of petty kingdoms and chieftains, yet they were loosely aligned to two royal centres of power, one at Tara, where the largely symbolic title of High King of Ireland was crowned periodically to kings of the influential Uí Anil dynasty throughout the early to mid-medieval period. The other was in the south, at Munster, where the great king Brian Baru would be born a century later. At the time of Thorgest's arrival, however, the armies of Munster had just marched to battle against Tara, plunging the Midlands into chaos. In other words, Thorgest could not have arrived at a better time. Thorgest immediately made it clear that he was a different sort of invader. Danish Vikings had been overwintering in Francia for decades, and likewise, Norsemen had been doing the same on the Northern Isles of Britain, and now Thorgest aimed to do the same in Ireland, yet he probably had no intention of stopping there, likely planning on an outright conquest of the entire island. The first signal of his intent was his choice to sack the most important holy site in Ireland, and by extension, one of the most important in Europe at the time, the monastic cathedral complex at Armagh, which he annihilated in 839. St. Patrick himself, the patron saint of Ireland, had ordained the complex at Armagh as the centre of Gaelic Christianity. Schools, relics and monks alike were slashed apart and put to the torch. In a final grisly act against the opposing faith of the Irish, Thorgest made a sacrifice to Odin upon St. Patrick's altar. As far as he was concerned, this was a holy war, and the Irish responded in kind rising up in outrage against the atrocity against their faith. Thorgest remained at Armagh for the winter, as more and more longships from all over Europe rode up the Irish river systems to rally to his course. Like never before, the waterways and coastlines of Ireland were now filled with piratical raiders from beyond the sea. By 841, Thorgest had seized a small settlement on the River Liffey, just to the south of Tara, on an excellent natural harbour with easy fording across the river. There, he established a strong defensible position by incorporating his longships into the defences of the new town. 
in an arrangement called a long fort, the first of many to spring up in Ireland. According to the Irish sources, it was around this time that Thorgest had himself grandly declared as the king of all the foreigners in Ireland, a title which would continue to be used by his kinsmen for centuries to come. The settlement came to be known as Dublin, and ominously, for the rest of the kingdoms of Britain and Ireland, its location was a mere stone's throw away. Dublin, the first truly Viking state in Western Europe, would prove to be a scourge for generations to come. Unlike in Francia, where successes had been fleeting and largely temporary up until this point, the Danes and Norsemen in Ireland were there to stay. Vikings continued to flock to Dublin over the next few years, as raiders continued to fan out across the rivers and coasts of Ireland, ravaging monasteries and amassing more and more wealth. Even native Irishmen and women joined the invaders, and a gritty frontier society was born. By 845, however, Thorgist had become the most wanted man in Ireland, and the kings of Munster and Tara put aside their differences for a time to defend their homeland. It was the king of Tara, Mael Shacnail, who managed to trap the Sea King in 845, and as a punishment for his sins, he had Thorgist loaded down with stones and thrown into Loch Oel to drown. Thorgist's death left a power vacuum in Dublin and within the other long forts that had begun to grow up elsewhere in Ireland at places such as Waterford, Limerick, Cork and Wexford. It had also ended the goal of an outright conquest of Ireland under the rule of a single dynasty. Newcomers continued to flood into the city from mainland Europe, Denmark and Norway. And by 850, a brutal civil war erupted between the various factions of the town. The Irish sources call it the war between the black foreigners, Danes, and the white foreigners, Norwegians. But there was another faction too, the Irish foreigners, Vikings who had been born in Ireland, many of whom were the descendants of Irish women. It was the Danes who got the early upper hand in the war, successfully scaling the walls of Dublin to put the town to the torch. Although they were soon hunted down by the vengeful Norsemen and ruthlessly massacred, the native Irish tried their luck too, with at least six unsuccessful sieges of Dublin recorded during the Civil War, all of them repelled at great cost to the Irish. Just to the north of Dublin, Mael Shucknail continued his war of expulsion, successfully routing Viking forces on at least two occasions and leaving hundreds dead on the field. Yet he could not definitively drive them out, and more and more continued to arrive on his shores as word spread of the great riches and land to be won on the Emerald Isle. By the mid-850s, two distinct rulers had surfaced amongst the two factions of Scandinavians in Dublin. The Danes had been brought together under the rule of a native Scandinavian, who may have recently been active in Francia, possibly at his father's side. His name was Imer, and he may well be the same figure as Ivar the Boneless, the leader of the great heathen army who swept through Britain in the 860s. The Norse, however, were led by an equally famous figure at the time, yet one more obscured by history today. His name was Olaf the White. Olaf had allegedly arrived in Ireland at around the same time as Thorgist's death, and was probably, like Ivar, the son of a famed sea king. The two young men used the power of their lineages, both probably claiming direct descent from Odin, to bring the Dubliners under control. Rather than continue the pointless and brutal civil war, much to the Irishman's horror, they made peace, even declaring themselves joint kings and equals. Thus began the lengthy history of the Scandinavian Kingdom of Dublin. Reports differ as to when exactly, or even where, Olaf was born. It seems likely that he was the son of the Norse chieftain Ingjald Helgesson, a warlord active in the Irish Sea in the first half of the 9th century. Upon his father's death, however, Olaf quickly rose to supremacy amongst the Dublin Norse, just as Ivar Ragnarsson rose amongst the Dublin Danes. In 853, tensions between the Hiberno Norse and the Hiberno Danes were finally quelled when Olaf and Ivar became joint kings. The first obstacle to tackle for their newfound alliance was the Irish High King of Tara, Mael Shacknail, who had been steadily rising in prominence amongst his kinsmen since his defeat of Thorgist in 845. 
After it became clear that the Norsemen and the Danes were in Ireland to stay, however, and weren't about to conquer the entire island, support for Maelshek Nail began to fall away. Olaf was able to strike up an uneasy alliance with Aid Findlake, the king of the northern Uia Neil, in order to curtail Maelshek Nail's power. This was to be the first of many alliances with native Irishmen against their neighbours. Finally, by 862, Maelshek Nail passed away, and his lands were split between rival claimants. This disunity allowed the Dublin Vikings to finally fully dedicate themselves to raiding the shores of Britain. Two great expeditions were launched in 865. One, dubbed the Great Heathen Army by Christian writers at the time, seems to have been coordinated alongside Scandinavians active in Francia, Frisia, the Irish Sea, and probably the entire Scandinavian world. Its destination was the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, rich and prosperous lands just a few days sailing away from Dublin. Ivar led this invasion, but no less devastating was another invasion into Pictland, led at the same time by Olaf. Little is known of Olaf's attack on Pictland, and it seems that before long he was back in Dublin. Ivar too was back after just a few short years, yet in that short time he had personally overseen the annihilation of no less than three ancient and revered European dynasties, East Anglia, Northumbria and Mercia, two of which he probably had a personal hand in the actual murdering of the ruling family. Yet just as quickly as he had ravaged his way into the English sources, Ivar was back in Ireland. In 870, in a brutal culmination of both of the Sea King's careers, the fortress of Dumbarton Rock, capital of the Brythonic Kingdom of Alt Clud, situated just to the south of Pictland, yet another ancient and revered kingdom was destroyed for good. The siege apparently lasted for four months, and at its end, the citadel was razed, and large numbers of Angles, Britons and Picts were brought back to Ireland to be sold at the slave markets. Thus ended a kingdom that had thrived in the north since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Olaf's son, Thorsten the Red, was also active in Pictland around this time, and he may have attempted conquests alongside the rulers of the Orkneys, though he was eventually betrayed and killed by his would-be allies. Faced with a brutal onslaught against his heartlands in the south of modern-day Scotland, and seeing his northern borders already crawling with Viking invaders, the king of the Picts at the time, Constantine I, could do little but attempt to weather the storm. He died fighting one such invasion, but not before he managed to defeat Olaf in battle in 872, and sent the old sea king to Valhalla. Ivar probably died around the same time, although little is known of his eventual fate. The descendants of these two kings in Dublin, the Uia Mare, would go on to dominate the Irish Sea for at least a century or more to come, and they thrived in Ireland for much longer. <laughs>